Welcome guys to the second to last section of this course. Thanks for your continued interest in this, you are awesome. We have a great topic for you this time, word embeddings, one of the great cornerstones in modern day NLP. We'll see what they are and why we need them, also what the main techniques used in NLP are. We'll go ahead and train our own word embedding model and visualize it. And you know I like to go a bit to the inspirational side in the last video. Now is no difference, so we'll have a look at all of the other fields word embeddings are helping as well. So first up, what exactly are word embeddings? We'll first tackle the question real quick, before moving on to a short history lesson and some use cases. So what exactly are the bloody things? Well, remember when we talked about making mathematical vectors out of language words to do machine learning with? Well, word embeddings are actually one and the same thing. The type of vectors though, and how we obtain them, are completely different. How we obtain them is different. We will embed context in them and try to capture relationships in a certain way. So the vectors become more meaningful. Also, the vectors themselves will look different. Instead of very sparse, very high dimensional vectors, we have dense, low dimensional vectors with continuous values obtaining a rich representation this way, that kind of look like this. A cool way to think about it is as such, which I've read at some places. It's that the dimension of word embeddings can describe certain aspects of the word. Like if you were to make a word embedding of cars, some of the dimensions could perhaps pertain to sportiness, manliness or feminineness of the car. Now how did this come to be? Well, like a lot of data science and machine learning concepts, the base idea dates back to the 1950s, after which the first tryouts took place and the first papers were launched. But it really kicked off with the famous paper from Thomas Michelop on the word to vec model, one of the main breakthroughs in the technology, which really put things in a higher gear. And a year later, Stanford came up with an alternative to word to vec GLOF, or Global Vectors. And jointly, these two have really made waves for embeddings and NLP in general. We'll be digging deeper into each one of those in future videos. Up until the point now where word to vec and embeddings are being used in numerous fields in and outside of NLP. Now, you can get really creative with word to vec I like to think that there are two main classes of use cases. That is to use them as a component or use them on their own. In practice, using them as part of a bigger solution will often be the most occurring use cases. If you read blog posts and papers about neural network architectures and deep learning applications in NLP, it's hard to not come across a word embedding layer as your first one. So, in essence, it's often a building block. Now, one of the reasons it's popular as well is that through pre-trained word embeddings, trained on huge corpora, you immediately get a nice feature representation. This helps you for your problem if you don't have that many data points. It kind of gives you a head start. Remember the text classification paper we talked about in the last section? Well, the first layer there was in fact a word embedding layer. Using them on their own, however, we can do a lot of really cool stuff with it as well. We can, for instance, use it for clustering. In one of the upcoming videos, we'll see that if trained properly, some nice distinctive clusters should be visible. So you can unleash your favorite clustering algorithm on it. And yeah, in one breath, I have to mention, of course, that the distances between the vectors can also be meaningful. You could, for example, use the cosine similarity between two vectors to see how closely related the words are. One final cool trick that doesn't always work in my opinion, because sometimes the results can be a bit abstract, it's vector relationships. Done well, word embeddings. In the example on the right, using word to vec more precisely, I don't really know if this trick applies to other methods as well. This should be able to capture some semantics or syntactic relationships between words. In a way that if you were to take the vector for king, add the vector for woman, and subtract the vector for man, you should come pretty near the vector for queen. That's pretty awesome, right? Right, I can imagine your hands must be itching by now. 